Picture that friend you met up with the other day. Why did the two of you become friends in the first place? Maybe you needed an ally to face an unknown environment. Could it be a genetic similarity? Or perhaps the two of you were riding an oxytocin high. Regardless of what forged this friendship, the two of you are helping each other be healthier, lower stress, and live longer. And it turns out, friendship isn't just human nature, it's pre-human nature. In traditional New Guinea society, if two strangers crossed paths while they were both away from their respective villages, they would engage in a long, drawn-out discussion of their relatives and acquaintances, trying to find some social connection, hence some reason not to kill each other. Historically, the world is a dangerous place for strangers. It's really part of our biological heritage to want the kind of friends that we can know we can count on. This is Dr. Robert Seiferth. He's a monkey expert. A primatologist, okay, yes. Great. Yeah. For the past 40 years, he's been studying the social behavior of mammals alongside his good friend and wife, Dorothy Cheney. They've done groundbreaking research on how friendships play out in the animal kingdom. Friendships are ubiquitous, and they make a huge difference in horses, chimpanzees, elephants, baboons, dolphins. These bonds lead to alliances and allow a group of tightly bonded males to take over a group of females and reproduce with them. So that's one reason friendship may exist, the biological power of the wingman. What else do our friendships have in common with animals? Monkeys actually, uh, they rely on all the same kinds of cues and basically the same circuits in their brains, um, well. Dr. Platt studies the behavior and biology of rhesus macaques who are free-ranging on an island near Puerto Rico. We were able to pull him off Monkey Island for long enough to pick his brain about his research. We follow each monkey for 10 minutes at a time and record everything that they do to try to understand how they are connected to each other. So when we do this Facebook analysis for monkeys, what we find is some monkeys who are in the middle, they have lots of connections and their friends have lots of connections. And there are monkeys on the edges who have like one friend. And then there's this group of monkeys who have no friends. It turns out that where monkeys are in the social network is heritable. In other words, there's a big evolutionary advantage to being popular. It's been shown that individuals with lots of friends have more offspring, and those offspring in turn have their parents' genetic je ne sais quoi. So you could say popularity breeds popularity. How it actually works, we're only beginning to understand. We know oxytocin, a hormone associated with bonding, increases when you experience closeness with another person. That boost promotes greater eye contact, which enables you to read emotions better, which in turn increases your sense of closeness. But what happens when you remove the face-to-face -face element of friendship? Now we find ourselves communicating in social media, texting, emailing, uh, merely liking things uh, you know, on Facebook. The medium allows us to have a much broader array of connections than we otherwise would be able to. That seems to be potentially a good thing. But does this impact the development of your ability to, to read other individuals and to really connect with them in a deep level? And, um, you know, I think we're going to see the consequences of that over the next, you know, coming decades. So while we don't yet know how friendship will evolve, one thing's for certain. There's power in a friend. Alone, you can only get so far. But with the right group of pals, it's easier to rise to the top. And that's been true since before the dawn of humankind.